Hello everybody, it's Daryl again and this is my idea for a plan to transition New Zealand to electric vehicles. Um, the main characteristics of the plan is that it has to be simple, it has to be low to no cost. It does not punish people who already did something or already bought a car. It has to be easy stuff that's easy to measure and check so that it can be accounted for and audited well. It has to not require new technology. We don't want to invent new stuff that's theoretical. It has to be all practical stuff that can already be done. It has to have stated goals and steps so that we know if we're actually doing the thing that we plan to do. Um, what's done already. So in New Zealand we have a, a few things supporting the uptake of electric vehicles. Um, we have the ECA Contestable Fund which funds projects and often this is used for subsidising the cost of charging infrastructure or to try new electric vehicle related things that otherwise um, people just wouldn't have the money or companies wouldn't have the money to have a go at. Uh, in New Zealand, all non-petrol vehicles, which includes electric vehicles, um, have a, a road user charge and it has um, weight class divisions, but we're talking about the lowest division, which is the less than 3.5 metric tons, uh, 3,500 kilograms, which is the uh, normal kinds of cars and trucks and, you know, uh, pickup trucks, vans, sports cars, that kind of stuff, SUVs and minivans. Uh, um, in, in New Zealand the petrol vehicles have the ruck as a tax that's just in the petrol so you don't have to display a road user charge certificate in your car. So you buy the road user charge certificates usually in blocks of about five or ten thousand kilometres and you display it in the window of your car and if you get pulled over by the police they can check that your odometer matches the um, what you've prepaid your road user charge for. But electric cars don't have to display one, they're actually exempt currently. Um, in New Zealand, used cars can be imported from Japan and UK, anywhere that's basically got the steering wheel on the proper side of the car for the car to be operated safely. So this is typically Japan and UK, with a lot of used electric cars coming from Japan. Um, the RUC exemption for electric vehicles uh, ends in 2021, which is this year, and uh, people who have busy lives have low knowledge of EVs, so a lot of people still don't even know that electric cars are exist. They just don't see them when they're driving around. They don't know that electric cars are electric cars. They don't know that electric car charging stations are car charging stations and park in front of them, annoying things like that. And also they don't see them in car yards because there's little visibility of electric cars at a lot of mainstream car yards. More on the current situation. The government had a goal of getting to 64,000 cars by the end of 2021, and there's about 4 million cars in New Zealand. Um, we've already tried the things that were on the previous slide, and also the government confused the market a lot by talking about this thing which I think was called the freebate scheme or the feebate scheme. I think it's freebate scheme. Um, and what, what it was, was they were going to implement a tax on inefficient vehicles, big pickup trucks and just other inefficient vehicles, and then use the money to cross-subsidize car companies to sell electric cars cheaper. But it, I think it's misguided because it doesn't actually reduce the price of electric vehicles by a pragmatic amount. Um, and why would you want to collect a tax and then give it to car companies? That would really just um, boost their profit, and I, I think that's silly. Um, 
there's reasons for doing something and almost all of that is to do with environmental and local pollution and things like that but I'd like to think of electric cars in New Zealand certainly helps the balance of payments because a lot of our electricity is just generated locally from renewable energy and that saves on pollution but also it keeps the money that we spend on electricity in New Zealand uh, because it goes to local power generation which keeps people in jobs generating their electricity so it's a virtuous cycle for New Zealanders and this will be the case in other countries too Australia and you know um, the United States um, would benefit from that too there seems to be a lot of talk and posturing um, and not much action. Um, there was a good start with the ECA scheme and having a goal to get to 64,000 vehicles. Um, so in my plan, um, we don't give vehicle companies much in the way of options. We just make a scheme and mandate it. Um, the time for debate has passed already. People have spent the last 10 or 20 years talking about the stuff and not doing much. Um, we don't want to increase the prices of things um, where, you know, people, people they, they budget buying their car or pickup truck or whatever it is to do the work they need to do or to do the errands they need to do. And we don't want to impose extra costs on on people that um, that are kind of like upfront costs. Uh, and we don't want to charge people who have already bought a car and tr treat treat them um, poorly um, after they've already spent their money making the decision that they've done. We don't want to harm people and family by charging them extra costs. And um, we probably should give discounts or incentives to people that are doing the right thing, but how can that be cost neutral? Um, so we need some we need some definitions. So uh, this is how I um, define electric vehicles. So you need an electric vehicle that's practical for just normal everyday usage, and I'd kind of feel that that's that's vehicles that do around two hundred kilometres on a charge can be basically swappable for ordinary every day. I mean, I'm sure that people take long trips and some people want longer range cars, that's great. Um, but this is uh, my main minimum definitions for electric vehicle. So normal electric vehicle has to be able to drive at least 180 kilometers on a single charge at 90 kilometers per hour. And that, that means you can just use it for sort of ordinary commuting. And we do have a few roads in New Zealand where you're allowed to drive 110 kilometers per hour, some, some highways and expressways. So you need to be able to get at least 150 kilometers at that speed and uh, because you, there might be the case that you have a fast commute um, traveling on expressways. And um, also the vehicles um, need to be able to rapid charge 100 kilometers of driving range in 20 minutes. There's a lot of vehicles that do better than that now, but this is a minimum. And so this is basically the equivalent of 2016 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf or a um, 2018 Hyundai Ioniq. So it's a completely achievable kinds of vehicles that are in existence that's what I'm defining as an electric vehicle and then plug-in hybrid vehicles um, this is a bit stricter than the typical plug-in hybrid vehicle I need it to be able to do at least 70 kilometers on a on a single charge in EV mode and have DC fast charging for an additional 50 kilometers of, of range in 20 minutes and that way um, if if you get to the point where petrol becomes extremely expensive, then people would be able to use their plug-in hybrid cars just as electric cars, just for doing all their ordinary daily commuting and stuff like that. So 70 kilometers is approximately double the New Zealand average daily commute. So for a plug-in hybrid car to be really functional, it needs to be able to um, cover you know 90% of people's daily commutes and. Um, that way that keeps the value of those vehicles high, you know, that, that makes them have good utility, even if petrol gets so expensive that you wouldn't want to be buying petrol. Um, and some examples of that is a 
2015 BMW i3 range extender vehicle which has a little petrol engine in it and the Japanese version of the Prius Prime um, which has fast charging and it has a, a larger battery than the Priuses do in other countries so it can be used as an electric car. Um, all of what I'm talking about is about new cars. I'm not talking about used cars. Used cars will continue to be able to be imported from Japan and the UK. Um, yeah, a new car is defined as a vehicle with less than a thousand kilometers on the odometer. And um, we're talking about that normal vehicles less than three and a half tons. And the vehicles also need to be... Um, they have to have a AC charging port for charging at home, which can be Type 1 or Type 2 charger connectors. These are just the kinds of connectors that the electric cars have on them, so you can charge them at home and also in a, like a car parking building or something like that. And the electric vehicles need to be fitted with um, a rapid charge connector, which is for fast charging. And Chadamo is a Japanese standard and CCS type 2 is the other type of rapid charging connector and those those charging connectors are um, supplied on all the New Zealand public fast chargers. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to improve uh, sales goals of EVs uh, which is um, you know what they do in other locations. So um, we just do a calculation uh, over each year for for your um, for your brand or car yard or your group of car yards if they're owned by one big company and we just count up all the cars that you sell and a certain percentage of your total sales have to be electric cars and also um, every car yard that has 10 cars on a on a physical yard in a location where you can stand there and look at some cars must have at least two electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids um, on on site so that people can see electric cars every time they go shopping for any car at all um, and there will be um, punishments and fines for companies that don't make their sales goals um, and so so then what I would have for the fine is uh, Actually, I might discuss that later. Um, car companies uh, can import vehicles that are not their main brand to make up the numbers if they don't have that many EVs for their main brand. Um, but they have to sell them on the yards with their main brand. And they can reband a vehicle if they want. You know, um, you can buy a car and put a different badge on it. That happens in certain markets. Um, big, big car building companies have overarching big groups of brands and so they they can take some brand their sub brand or mark where they um, sell electric vehicles and they can rebrand them to the other brand um, I'm going to exclude some some car companies sales companies from the system so so car companies that just sell fewer than 100 vehicles um, say maybe you've got a specialist um, sports cars and you only sell a couple of dozen of them per year then you can just be excluded because it just doesn't really contribute much to the system um, but if you if you own a company that pulls a, a bunch of small specialist brands and you sell more than a hundred cars in total then you have to be you're in the EV selling game now because you're you're you can't just divide your big company into lots of small companies to not participate in the scheme. Um, so if, if your overall corporate structure in New Zealand sells more than 100 vehicles, you're selling the mandated number of electric vehicles. Um, car companies that only sell electric vehicles don't have to participate in the scheme. Um, this means that if you actually sell small specialist electric vehicles like neighborhood electric vehicles, the kinds of things that are used um, on a university campus or in a retirement um, a retirement village, then then those sorts of vehicles, um, you know, you can sell whatever you want. You're just selling all electric vehicles. Or you might be selling really amazing sports cars that are all electric, and that's fine. You, if you only sell electric cars, then you're already selling electric cars. Um, 
all, all of the um, the companies can't trade their sales statistics between companies. So you can't buy and sell your quotas um, to, to make up a quota if you don't make your sales. You actually have to find some cars and physically sell them on your lot. And if you're having problems um, selling cars on your lot, then you have to find some cheap cars and sell them at cheap prices to force your sales figures up. This means that every car yard that's in the scheme will be selling electric cars physically on their sites so that there's the visibility to the public of electric cars being bought and sold um, as an everyday occurrence. You'll see that wherever a lot of cars are being sold. That means you can't just put all your put all your um, electric cars on a special sub lot. You have to you have to be selling them everywhere. Um, the EVs and PHEVs have to be at least as good as those minimum specifications that I talked about on the previous pages to count in the statistics. Um, so that means you can't make a, a useless short-range car that only has 60 kilometres of driving range and is not actually practical for people to use. You have to sell cars that people can use for their normal everyday driving like they would any petrol car. Um, If you sell a lot of electric vehicles more than the required percentage, you may also sell some short-range electric cars that you know cater for those markets of people who just need short commute cars or little utility cars. Um, so it's okay as long as you're you have the mandated percentage of vehicles that meet it met the previous specification, then then that's good. Um, Companies not making their sales figures get fined the average non-EV sales price per car for their company multiplied by the percentage that they missed out by. So if the mandate is to sell 10% electric cars and you only sell 8% electric cars, then what we do is work out whatever that 2% sh shortage is, would work out how many cars that is, that, you know, that might work out to be 20 cars, um, and then you have to take your non-EV cars, find out what the average price is, and then multiply that by 20, and that tells you what your fine will be that year. So it's quite harsh if, you, if they miss the goals. And the point of this is to make car companies find fine electric cars and bring them to New Zealand and sell them here. That's the whole point. And we're not giving them money to, to find those cars or discount them, they have to work out how to find cheap cars. And they can do it because there are some quite cheap electric vehicles available in other countries um, that are just utilitarian vehicles. So here's how I'd implement the scheme. Um, let's call the first year of the scheme 2022. It can be a calendar year, but you could use a financial tax year. I don't, I don't care. Um, so in 2022, all new car sales companies need to sell 5% electric vehicles. They can be pure electric um, vehicles or PHEVs as defined earlier. And in 2022, the minimum range requirements are exempt, but the charging port requires requirements must be met. This means that if, if the you know, it's short notice, so we need to practically allow um, these car companies to find some um, brand new electric cars overseas and bring them in. And I don't mind if, if they're a little bit short of range in the first year, um, but they have to work on the charging network that we have in New Zealand. And then in 2023, the sales required will be 10% electric and plug-in uh, electric vehicles. And um, the range requirements must be met and the charging port requirements must be met. Um, and if the uh, sales exceed 10%, you, you can sell some cars that have short range. That's okay because people who just need a, an errands car, a second family car, can buy those vehicles. As you can see, the um, car companies will be motivated to find and sell electric vehicles. Um, they can import or sell vehicles that are not their primary brand. Um, the vehicles just have to meet the specifications. That's what I'm saying. 
in 2024, 15% of all vehicle sales have to be EVs and PHEVs, but also the minimum EV range will be bumped up to 250 kilometres and the PHEV range will be bumped up to 120 kilometres. Um, that's so that these are truly cars that can be used as just ordinary cars. And then in 2025, um, we're going to change to 10% steps. So now we're up to 25% of vehicle sales have to be electric. In 2026, 35%. And also we bump up the minimum EV range again to 300 kilometres. Um, that means that you can take quite long trips in your vehicle and not worry about having to recharge too often. And then it just increases by 10% per year up to 95%. And I don't really care if one, once we're up to 95% electric vehicle sales, you know, it, it just doesn't matter. Um, there would be some point where you just abandon the scheme because now there's so many electric vehicles being sold that the transition's just happening anyway and you just can't go back from that. Um, and then we've got some parallel measures. Um, we, we've got to do something with RUC at the same time because RUC is how road, road user charges is nominally how the government gathers... Um, money to pay for the maintenance of roads well highways between cities actually um, so the current ruck exemption for electric vehicles expires in 2021 and so what I'd do is I'd create a new and slightly different ruck exemption for 2022 to 24 um, all the pure EVs will just get 15,000 kilometres of free ruck per year. So that's the, that's roughly the average number of kilometres driven per year per normal car in New Zealand. Um, so anybody who's just driving the normal amount or less won't really have to effectively pay for a ruck. But people who have got long commutes and are, are driving uh, more than 15,000 kilometres per year maybe taxi drivers or courier drivers, they would they would have to pay for their ruck after they've done 15,000 Ks in each each year. Um, and then in 2024 to 28, the pure EVs would get um, 10,000 kilometres of ruck. So the free ruck is reducing as there's more and more electric cars on the road because we actually have to continue to pay for roads. And after 2028, all pure EVs will continue to have 5,000 kilometres of free ruck forever. Um, and there's a purpose for doing that, which I'll talk about um, in a minute. But in 2028, um, PHEVs, because PHEVs don't pay ruck because they have a petrol engine in them, so they've never been included for ruck because they're still considered to be petrol cars, even though they can largely run on electricity. Um, so what we'd do is um, give them a uh, 5,000 kilometres per year. No, we'd make them pay for 5,000 kilometres of ruck per year, irrespective of how far they actually drive. And the vehicles with over 120 kilometres of range will pay for 10,000 kilometres per year, irrespective of how far they actually drive. Um, and this this means that that's just a fixed amount and that can be that can be charged in the annual registration so every every car with a number plate in New Zealand pays the annual pays the annual registration and those PHEV vehicles we can just add the price of that ruck coverage so that it can be administered pretty easily that's just changing the price of the rego um, and then what else fines oh yeah so money that um, money that's collected in fines just goes into the government tax pool and we don't do anything special with it. it just remember that um, the vast majority of money that goes into the New Zealand's tax pool just pays for superannuation for retired people so that they have good quality of life um, while they're retired. And the um, got to remember that when, whenever the government collects tax money, there's no moral connection between the money that's collected and you know what what they use it for and what they collected from they're not connected um, 
people can feel good that if money is collected in fines, which is actually extremely unlikely, um, then um, it can be used to to fund uh, ruck and EV charger infrastructure. So we'll have to we'll have to um, expand our charging network for people to take long journeys, especially with those cars that only have sort of medium to short range uh, driving. Like I drive an electric car where effectively you have to stop and recharge it every about 120 kilometers if you take a long trip. So that's a bit, um, so you need a chargers along the highways. But we have petrol stations along highways, same same difference. Um, and uh, people will be upset by some of this. Um, yeah, the car companies will cry, but I, I don't really care. Some other people might get a little bit upset, but I don't. I don't really care. And um, people who want who want things to be fair for them, they, you know, there's always somebody who there's always somebody who has some odd benefit from some things. And I, I hope that um, this this scheme will try and iron those things out um, and I don't care if five percent of vehicles are not electric um, we can have a few old cool cars still hanging around they'll be good for Sunday drives and you might need to see that they're shiny and take some photos of them and it's good to have those things around and also there will be a few um, there'll be a few special usage cases um, you know, there might be some people who need diesel vehicles because they're just like way out in the country somewhere and it's not practical to um, power their car by electricity because there's no electricity infrastructure way out in a forest or up a mountain or something. Um, and um, one thing about that, um, that 5,000 kilometre ruck exemption, this means that all old electric vehicles will be... Um, that only get used a little bit will will have this advantage of this ruck exemption forever, which means that these will be good vehicles. You know, maybe um, you know um, younger and poorer people will want to use because um, they won't have the the ruck, the road user charge. They, these vehicles for that five thousand kilometres, they'll effectively be about a quarter of the price to operate per kilometer and that means like retired people could have could keep a car um, and use it for going to the supermarket or visiting friends and it, it means that um, you could have just a car that um, that you use for driving to the train station if you if you live too far from the train station to commute to work um, you know it's not fun in winter to have to walk in the rain to the train station um, so and that will also it will keep those older electric vehicles on the road and keep them being used rather than just being scrapped um, because there's a, there'll be a lot of there'll be a point where there's a lot of a lot older electric vehicles that are still fine for driving 10 or 20 kilometers a day or something like that um, and you just don't want them to be scrapped because uh, you end up with uh, some cost structure that makes it cheaper to scrap them than to keep using them because I actually think that continuing to use a car that's already built is something that um, uh, prevents a lot of emissions um, so that's that's quite good anyway that's my plan hope you like it and enjoy um, yeah think it through uh, I think this makes more sense than taxing gas guzzlers than using that money to subsidize car companies it just doesn't make any sense to me um, the the free bait scheme. Uh, thanks for watching. Like and subscribe and all of that stuff. And um, uh, give me uh, some com comments in the in the comments so that uh, tell me what you liked and what you don't like. Thanks. Bye.